here in, uh, in July, July 2014 is when we started construction. But there has been a lot of planning that has gone into this particular project that dates back as far back as 2006. Um, and so in that, there's been other studies that have been benchmarked with our project. We've looked at Tucson, we looked at D.C., Atlanta, uh, Portland. I actually just came back from Portland and Salt Lake to actually see their system. And so through that process, we realized and learned that streetcar transit is very, uh, is, is, is very key as it relates to just moving people, having another, another means of, transport, of, of, of transit, as well as economic development. So Atlanta, they opened their, uh, their rail system before the end, of the end of the year of 2014. They're actually doing some additional testing now as we speak. And then DC is doing some additional testing in there. Um, to start data is, uh, is forthcoming. But Portland and Tucson is, is going. This project is a little bit different because M1 Rail is a 501c3. They're a totally separate entity. When you look at these other cities that I just named off, those municipalities actually, uh, their cities, their transit departments, their city departments, municipalities, the, the, their regional transit built their system. So they own and operate their system. This is different that we actually have a, a historic partnership that is majority funded by uh, private dollars, corporate dollars, as well as philanthropic dollars as well. So just at a glance, um, with, the, with our project, it is 3.3 miles from larger at the most southern terminus to uh, Grand, uh, West Grand Boulevard at the most, the most northern terminus, then 3.3 back. So we say 3.3 straight, but it's a loop of a 6.6 mile uh, transit system. We do have 20 stops. Um, some are center running, some are curve running. Um, as it relates to the stops, this is not the uh, traditional, the sense sometimes people are thinking of uh, traditional subways and the larger footprints. They're, we're not taking up a lot of footprint. We're not uh, taking land in order to build the stations. We are literally in the right of way um, in terms of our actual, our actual footprint of, of stations. So it's not to the extent of having retail, but really to activate around the station with the restaurants and businesses that are there along, along, along Woodward. We're going to have six modern uh, street rail uh, street cars. Um, you know, we are low, low flooring and, and also ADA in terms of level boarding. You know, we used to, we've even said in our presentation, and I actually got to see it in, in, in full action with in Portland. Portland uses a bridge plate. It's not level boarding. So there were a couple times when I was there that there were some of their constituents that were in a wheelchair that because the bridge plate was broken, they were not able to access to access the streetcar. And so with our particular system, we have the ability that is level boarding. So regardless of if the bridge plate, we don't have that, that, um, that obstruction as well as level boarding. So it's one floor. We don't have a couple of steps. So again, just making it easier for everyone to get on here from the senior community as well as those um, that may be in wheelchairs. So that's a, a, a really good, a really good point of clarification. Our project costs about $140 million of a project, $5 million operating costs. In addition to our project, as Nicole mentioned, there are some additional partners that are part of it. Um, MDOT is, is one of those main partners, and they're actually rebuilding Woodward from curb to curb from Sibley to Chandler. So all of the, uh, all of the potholes and the things that everyone you know, sees out there, all of that is going to be actually renovated from curb to curb. And then we also have our technology sensor in the north end. So from a user experience perspective, um, we again, we want to make it so that it is for everyone to, to be able to have accessibility on, on, our, on our street cars. So we want to have access for bicycles. We want to be able to have um, the accessibility for wheelchairs as well. We're looking at different, um, different methods of payment, so through an app, through uh, different systems at the station, as well as obviously being able to, for those that don't have technology or a credit card as well, we will still have the ability to pay, pay cash too. So we're looking at all those different, those different systems, as well as looking in to uh, starting the conversation with DDOT and SMART and people who as it relates to other transit authorities to figure out connectivity. Because right now, um, you have to have a people mover car, you have to have a DDOT car, you have to have a SMART car. So again, looking at it holistically, how can we be a part of that conversation to have connectivity along all of our systems? This is just an image, so people kind of have an idea of what the streetcar, this is not the actual streetcar we're going with, this is just to depict um, how it, it, it interacts with traffic. It does go with the flow of traffic. 
Um, it is not a dedicated lane. The purpose of this particular streetcar system is, again, to circulate people throughout the corridor as another means of uh, getting throughout the corridor as well. We've done, um, you know, with this project and Cresby leading the uh, giving initiative of $50 million, we have always focused our project to be a community-driven project. So that means that, you know, we've created everything from community advisory councils, business advisory councils, to be able to provide uh, or to receive input from the community as it relates to our project. So that goes from how we built out our contracts to how we created the internship projects. They're all a part of those particular programs. We've had a series of meetings, and we'll continue to do that. Um, we had, when we first kicked off our construction, we, uh, we're doing the same thing as we're doing now. Our key points of, 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 of schedule for us is really to go out a couple times a year into the communities and give an update as to this is where we are. So we're continuing to do that as we did last year as well. When we, um, we talk about our tech center a lot within the, uh, in the North End, when we actually um, decided and had conversations as it relates to where the rail system would actually end, there was a lot of, uh, lot of feedback from the community that they wanted to be able to provide some input as it relates to the design of the tech center and what it looks like. So we had a series of meetings with the community within the North End, North End residents to really talk about what do you want it to look like? What are your concerns? What are things that we can do in order to uh, make this, this, this building a part of the community? And so from that, we took all of their input and we created an actual RFP based off of their input. So when we had our contractors to respond to a request for proposal, they were essentially responding based off of the content that was, that was given to us by the community. So we're really, uh, we're proud of just our aggressiveness to really make sure this project is an inclusive project. Um, you know, as we talk about development, we talk about road work, we talk about construction and things that are happening, uh, we want to make sure that Detroit-based businesses are a part of it. We want to make sure that minority women-owned businesses are a part of it. We want to make sure that Detroit-owned businesses are a part of it. And so disadvantaged business enterprise, DBEs, we want to make sure they are a part of it. So, we did some very creative things in order to make it a more inclusive process, um, all the way down to not only just from a construction perspective, but down to our community relations, down to our sign language interpreter, down to any way that we can make sure that we are engaging as many Detroiters um, and diversity in the project has been key for us. And so because of that, as it relates to construction, specifically, we're nearly 27% um, of inclusion on our project which the national average for DBE on a transportation project is at about 11, 11 or 12 percent. So, you know, we're really proud of that with MDOT. We were able to, to meet our number at 27 percent, so MDOT has been great with that, uh, with us achieving that. Workforce development, same thing that's key. You know, our project, you hear a lot of conversations of uh, projects, and they say, you're going to create 8,000 jobs, 5,000 jobs. <coughs> our project is not a large project. Um, really, where we're going to get our workforce development is when we actually hire Detroit-based businesses. And when you hire Detroit-based businesses, when you hire minority women, DBE-based businesses, a lot of those businesses, are re their employment base is reflective of that as well. And so that was really our approach is to figure out, well, how can we make sure with working with the different unions, the different skilled trade unions, to make sure that we do have diversity on the workforce on our construction site, and we were able to achieve that as well. Our internship program this year, uh, last year was our uh, inaugural year, and, and Nicole did a great job. We teamed up with City Connect last year, where, again, our goal is not just on the construction side, but how can we expose our young people to an industry that is not traditional um, in a lot of different communities. And so this year, we actually had 11 <coughs> interns that came from HBCUs and Michigan State, and we had a couple of high school students that came as well, and so we're looking to do that again this year. We're actually going to partner up again with City Connect. As you all heard a couple days ago, Mayor Duggan made an announcement in order to have 5,000 students um, that he wants to actually have employment opportunities. We will be a part of that initiative um, to make sure that we're putting Detroiters and our young people to work, so we will be a part of that internship program as well. So schedule timeline at a glance. Um, we started construction, as I say, stated, in July of last year. Um, this 2015 is really going to be our main crux of construction. That's where we're going to have 
uh, the majority of just work taking place throughout the corridor. In 2016, we will have continue to have some work that will be taking place as it relates to some vertical work, as we call it, which is basically uh, building out our stations, as well as in 2016, in the fall uh, of 2016, fall, winter, we have to do testing. So because we are, we are a majority funded, uh, private funded, but we're also a federal funded. We received a significant amount of federal funds as well that once we receive a penny, we are now a federal project. So there are certain things in terms of uh, things that we have to adhere to as it relates to safety, as it relates to testing, so we will continue to do testing so that we can open up for operation in 2016. So in 2015, we learned a lot. 